I should like to call your attention this evening to the words which are to be found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 40th chapter, and the 5th verse. The 5th verse in the 40th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Let me remind you of the context by reading from the first verse up until this fifth verse. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it, together, or all together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. In other words, this fifth verse in this great and magnificent chapter comes as a part of this preliminary announcement and proclamation of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been looking at it on previous Sunday evenings. This is the third time that we have come to it together. Uh, you have but to know your New Testament very cursorily uh, to know that uh, this statement here obviously is one that points forward uh, to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These very words about a voice crying in the wilderness are attributed by the Gospels to John the Baptist the forerunner of our Lord. And this very word that we are looking at tonight in the fifth chapter is again quoted in exactly the same way. And all flesh, we are told, shall see the salvation of God. That's how it's put there in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Now, I'm calling attention to this for this reason, that nothing is quite so clear as the fact that there are large numbers of people who are not Christian and who are outside the Christian church for one reason only, and that is primarily that they rarely have never known what the gospel is, what it says, what it is about. I have been reminding you that so many such people, when they do come under the sound of the gospel and when they hear it, express their amazement and astonishment. They say, I never knew that that was the gospel before. Why, well, they obviously had got some other idea concerning it. We all tend to have that, don't we? Everybody born into this world thinks automatically that he or she knows what Christianity is. We all feel competent, and we've all done it many times. We all feel competent to dismiss the Christian gospel and the Christian faith. Everybody feels that he can talk about religion and about Christianity and have an argument about it. It's a, a topic of conversation that never fails to arouse interest, and we all feel absolutely competent. If it were some abstruse question about science or something like that, well, we'd say, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. But we all assume we know everything about Christianity. Not that we've ever read the Bible, of course, but... Uh, it is one of those prejudices inherent in men as the result of sin and the fall that he thinks he knows all about religion and all about Christianity and therefore can argue about it and can dismiss it. Now I say such people find constantly when they truly hear it that it's something very different from what they'd ever thought or imagined. And it is in order to save any who may be in this congregation at this moment who are in that position from the awful tragedy of robbing themselves of the blessings of this glorious gospel through just such prejudiced ignorance that I am calling attention 
to this great announcement and proclamation of the gospel here in this 40th chapter of the gospel uh, of the of the work of the prophet Isaiah now i've been at pains to emphasize this great point because he keeps on repeating it it is that this gospel and its salvation is the most astounding and astonishing thing that this world has ever known it's altogether different from everything that we'd ever have imagined but the thing about everything else that characterizes it is its glorious character its amazing quality for instance it starts off with those words comfort and that's the biggest shock many people ever get it's the biggest shock in a sense we all get because we always start with a prejudice against god that he is someone against us who is waiting to crush us and yet god says calls his prophet and calls his servants and says go and comfort my people speak ye comfortably to jerusalem speak to the heart of jerusalem god here in his infinite condescension knows that what we all need as the result of the way in which we are battered and bruised by sin and evil in this world of time is to be dealt with gently and soothed and comforted and that is precisely what he gives us comfort ye comfort ye my people saith your god and then he goes on to tell us the nature of this comfort it is that the terrible warfare in which we found ourselves for so many years is accomplished it's finished sin is warfare sin is a hard task master the way of the transgressor is hard and we all know it perfectly well the life of sin is not a life of happiness it's a life of wretchedness ultimately it's a hard bondage it's a warfare and the announcement of the gospel is that you can be delivered out of it that god is ready to pardon your sins and your iniquity that he is ready i say to change your whole condition and that he is ready to shower his blessings upon you he'll give you double for all the punishment that you deserved he will shower his blessings upon you in a most abundant manner now that's the statement here and the new testament is nothing in a sense but uh, a great elaboration of all that the apostle paul he liked to put it like this he said that he was called to be a preacher and an apostle and what was he preaching he was preaching he tells us the unsearchable riches of christ that's it he has given double for all our sins now that is the essential message of the gospel and nothing less than that to a world of rebels who have rebelled against god god sends this message of peace and of comfort and then we saw last sunday night that uh, that kind of comfort is possible for us only because of what god has done in sending his only son into this world that is the momentous thing that's announced he says here that uh, they must make a highway for our god prepare ye the way of the lord and we looked last sunday night at the way in which that highway has been prepared you and i couldn't have this comfort my dear friends were it not that this great personage had come along that new highway which necessitated the incarnation his humbling the raising of human nature the new way and finally we saw this that we will never know these blessings individually until we have prepared a way for him in our own hearts also that was the message of john the baptist john the baptist was this man crying out in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord and john was a preacher who didn't leave you in any uncertainty as to what that meant he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins he turned to those people and said now don't say to me that we are abram's children don't think he says that you can be right with god simply because you're you're jews and israelites children of abraham god he said could of these stones raise up children unto abraham don't rely he says on anything like that and the message is equally necessary today my friends 
We mustn't rely upon our parents. We mustn't rely upon belonging to a particular church or denomination or anything else. God can create people like that out of stones. No, no, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. It's got to be a thorough work, this re repentance. We've got to be honest in the presence of God and open. And allow him to search us and to speak to us. We must conceal nothing. And then we are told, if the way is prepared by repentance, the message of comfort and of deliverance and of pardon will come to us. Well, no, that's the essence of this whole message. But you see, the prophet com contemplating all this is overwhelmed with a sense of its greatness and its glory. He can't get over it. He says, in having said all that, he says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. What's he talking about? Well, he's still talking about this wonderful salvation. Now let me put it in a simple form by putting it like this. This gospel and its message of salvation is the most astounding and the most glorious thing that has ever come into this world and that mankind has ever heard of. And having said that, I ask a question. Do you believe that? Is that your view of it? Now, we all talk, the current terminology is we talk about being thrilled, don't we, by things? And we get excited, and we'll stand for hours and sit for hours and suffer inconvenience in order to see things that are glorious and wonderful and that appeal to us. Is this gospel as great in your estimation as those things? Do we really believe that this Christian message, this Christian faith, this Christian salvation is the most glorious, amazing, astounding thing that has ever happened in this world of time or ever can happen? Because, according to this prophet, according to the teaching of the Bible everywhere, that is the simple truth concerning it. And therein, you see, we see the nefarious influence of the devil who is described in the Bible as the God of this world. Men and women, speaking generally and in the mass and in the main, have no interest in this whatsoever. They see nothing in it. Nothing at all. Something to be spat upon. Something to be ridiculed and to be despised. Something that's an insult to an intellectual person. Something to be laughed out of court. That's their attitude towards it. And yet what we are told here is this, that this is nothing but a manifestation of the glory of the Lord. The most amazing and astonishing thing that has ever taken place. Well now, that's the aspect of the matter that I want to call your attention to tonight. And I do so with all the solemnity that I can commend for this good reason. That our eternal destiny de depends upon and hangs upon this very thing. I either take the view that this gospel of Jesus Christ is the most wonderful thing in the world, or else it's nothing. It's one or the other. And my eternal destiny depends upon the view I take. Now let me present it to you therefore like this. People often say that what they'd like to know is, what is God like? What is God, they say, what is God like? Now that's a, a perfectly right and a perfectly fair question to ask. But the answer that the Bible gives to that question everywhere is the answer that is given in our text this evening. The supreme attribute of God is glory. That's the statement of the Bible about God everywhere. His glory. What's it mean by glory? Well, it means beauty. It means majesty. It means splendor. It means greatness. It is something that is quite ineffable. It is something that is so transcendent and so great and glorious 
that man can never arrive at it as a result of his own effort and his own seeking and his own striving. Indeed, not only can man's mind not arrive at a true understanding and knowledge of God, his imagination cannot either. Because we start with this fundamental postulate that God dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto, which no man hath seen nor can see. The glory of God and the being of God are such that no man can approach unto it. He's, no man has ever seen it or can see it. That's the glory of God in his eternal being. And yet I say the most important thing for us is to know God. Without a knowledge of God we are undone. All our problems indeed, as we've already seen, arise from our ignorance of God because we don't know God, because we haven't this knowledge of God. You read the Apostle Paul in his first chapter of the Epistle to the Romans and he'll say that that is really the cause of the decline and fall of the whole of mankind. Men, he said, who started with a knowledge of God didn't choose to retain that knowledge but put it on one side and in the end he finds himself worshipping the creature rather than the creator. He worships beasts and creeping things, anything but God, and has lost sight of the glory of God. Why? Because he didn't glorify him as God when he knew him. Well, very well, what can happen to us? I say that is the supreme need to know God, and yet... We can't arrive at it. The greatest philosophers have failed. The world by wisdom knew not God. We are, our minds are too small. We are too unworthy. God is so essentially glorious. We can't by any kind of faculty, whatever we may try, we can't arrive there. Well, are we therefore without hope? No. The answer of the Bible is that God in his infinite kindness and condescension has been pleased to reveal himself unto us. And as our text tells us, to reveal and to manifest something of his own glory. How does he do so? Well, I mustn't keep you with these preliminary considerations, but you know that 19th Psalm which we read together at the beginning reminded us of this, that God incidentally has revealed something of his glory even in nature and creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There's no question about that. You take a creation as you see it round and about you, and if you look at it truly, again this is the argument of the Apostle Paul in that selfsame first chapter of the Epistle to the Romans, you rarely look at it and let it speak to you, says the Apostle, and you'll see something of the glory of God. The order, the design, the arrangement, the perfection of it all. You look at the mountains and the valleys and the rivulets and the streams. You see the swallows coming back with this strange regularity in the spring and the cuckoo coming almost exactly to the same date year by year and all this. And you say, well, what is this? Is this accidental? Is this fortuitous? Is this some accidental meeting of atoms and protons and electrons? And if you listen to a man like the late Sir James Jeans, you say, of course it isn't. That's impossible. This all means a mind, a transcendent mind, a glorious mind at the back of it all. Creation, the heavens, declare the glory of God, the one who's brought them all into being, the one who's fashioned them all and balanced them all and produced them all and sustains them all. My friends, if we had eyes to see and if we began to think and to ponder and to meditate, we'd see God in all these things. I have sometimes said that I'm rather sorry for men and women who have never studied anatomy and physiology. I find it very difficult to understand a man or a mind 
which uh, having learned something about the human frame and its working does not believe in God oh this human body is enough in and of itself and I sometimes thought of an instrument like the human eye with its subtlety and its balance and its delicacy to say that a thing like the eye has just evolved accidentally fortuitously my friends it's monstrous there is nothing comparable to it it's so amazing it's so astounding it reveals the glory of God oh I well understand the men I believe he was actually a Londoner who happened to go down into the country for a holiday at the end of August and he stood he having taken a walk in the country down a lane he stood at a gate and looked across a field of golden grain and looking at it he said well done God quite right if you haven't seen the glory of God in a ripened field of wheat my friend you've been blinded by the God of this world the devil the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork it's shouting at us all around look at these flowers see something of the touch and the hand and the artistry of our eternal God and maker he's revealed it partly his own glory in that way but it doesn't stop at that Oh, you read your history books and you'll see the glory of God coming out again. If you've got eyes to see, you'll see the glory of God in history in exactly the same way as you see it in nature and in creation. I mean this. In the very story of the rise and the development and the ultimate wane and passing of great dynasties and great empires, I see nothing but the glory of God. Man, you see, is always self-confident and has been from the very beginning. He began to show it when he tried to build that Tower of Babel. He was going to rise to the heavens and be a god. And men has ever continued to be like that. Great kings have arisen and great empires have arisen. And they've thought they've been perfect and wonderful. They were gods. They began to worship themselves. And down they've gone. Isn't that the whole story of history? The rise and the wane of dynasties and of powers and of nations and it's all because as this 40th chapter of this book of the prophet Isaiah tells us that the Lord has blown upon them and that the nations to him are like the fine dust of the balance or a drop in a bucket read your history books and see the pride and the arrogance of men inflating itself to the heavens and being dismissed almost in a moment and in a flash. It's there in history. But coming on supremely, you get it in this Old Testament history. And that's what makes the Old Testament such a wonderful book, that it's a book that reveals the glory of God. There's nothing so sad as to hear people saying they see nothing in the Old Testament. And even some Christians are foolish enough to say that they can't understand why the early church decided to keep on the Old Testament. My friend, they kept on the Old Testament because it's not only necessary as a preliminary introduction to the new, it's a constant manifestation of the glory of God. And after all, Christian salvation is to bring us to God, not to give us pleasing sensations, but to bring us right with God. What is the chief end of men after all? Is it to be happy? No. It is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And the Old Testament teaches us about the glory of God. Let me remind you hurriedly of some instances. Take the story of the flood. What's that? Nothing but a manifestation of the glory of God. The world that sinned against him and wouldn't listen to his warning through Noah at last is judged. The glory of God was revealed in the flood. Again in the Exodus, in the crossing of the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his might and his power, tyrannizing over this little people. Look at them. Look at their chariots in the midst of the Red Sea as the floods close in upon them and they're destroyed and the Israelites look back and see the dead bodies of the Egyptians upon the shore. What is it? 
a manifestation of the glory of God. God blew upon Pharaoh and his hosts, and that was the end of them. And go on and read the story of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, the mount that couldn't be touched because of the smoke and the fire and the trembling and any animal or anything that touched was killed. What is it? Oh, it's God revealing his glory in the giving of the law and giving some manifestation of the eternity of his power. And then go on, if you like, and read about a man like Moses turning to God and saying one afternoon, Oh, you've given me the task of leading these people and I'm afraid of it and who am I? I'm not prepared to go up unless you come with me. Now he went further and he said, Show me thy glory. And God said to him, All right. He put him in the cleft of a rock and as it were put his hand upon him and said, You shan't see my face for no man can see me and live but I'll show you my hinder parts. And the glory of the Lord passed by and Moses was never the same again. And go on reading the history. Read of the deliverances of the children of Israel. Conquered by their enemies, apparently helpless, finished. God suddenly comes and acts, and the enemy is routed. The children of Israel are free. The whole story of the Old Testament is the story of the manifestation of the glory of God. But, my dear friends, all this according to this fifth verse of this 40th chapter of Isaiah, pales into insignificance by the side of this other thing to which I'm calling your attention. It is as the result of the preparing of this highway and the coming of this person that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall behold it. Here is the full, the final manifestation before men of the glory of God. Well, how? Well, now, this, I say, is the most enrapturing theme of the whole scripture. The Christian message, the Christian salvation, is the ultimate manifestation of the glory of God. How? Well, in this, in this way. First of all, the very fact that God ever sent his Son into the world is a manifestation of his glory. God so loved the world that he gave, he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you ever considered the plan of salvation? It's a glorious manifestation of the glory of God. There before time, the blessed God planned this salvation of yours and mine and thereby revealed something of himself that he's never revealed in any other way. This is the way to get to know God. But let me hurry to something still more important. The glory of God is revealed, as we are told here, in the person of the Son of God himself. Now, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was very fond of saying that in different ways. Take that statement we read at the beginning out of the first chapter of John's Gospel. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father he hath declared him. No man can see God and live as God told Moses. Well, then how can we know God? Well, here's the answer. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus Christ came into this world partly to reveal to us, to bring to us this knowledge of the glory of the ineffable God. He put it in other ways. Listen to him putting it again like this. The time had come for him to die upon the cross and to leave his disciples and his followers. And he told them that. And they were all downcast and crestfallen. They said to one another, what can we do without him? So he turned to them and said, let not your hearts be troubled. He believed in God, believe also in me. And went on to say, 
that he was going to prepare a place for them. And yet they were unhappy about it. Thomas was unhappy about it. Philip was unhappy about it. And our Lord looking at them said these wonderful words. He who hath seen me hath seen the Father. O oh Lord, said Philip, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. If you could only show us the Father, said Philip, then I think we'd be able to bear the parting. Uh, you're telling us that you're going to leave us. But uh, if you could only show us the Father before you went somehow, then we could go on living. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip, said our Lord? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou therefore, show us the Father? The Son, you see, has revealed the glory of God. And then the Apostle Paul takes up the same theme and he puts it like this, in this staggering statement. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. My friends, there are times when I don't understand myself, leave alone, understand you that we can contain ourselves as we contemplate this staggering truth and it's a fact of history that in this world of time has lived the one of whom it can be said that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in the babe of Bethlehem in the boy age 12, confuting the doctors of the law in the temple, in the carpenter who works from the age of 12 to the age of 30 without anybody paying much attention to him, that is the one in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in a corporal form. And you and I get excited about the headings in the newspaper and don't know anything about this and are not thrilled by this and don't talk about this. We talk about these things that come and go and this we are not interested, we are not concerned. And grudge the time we give to it. We have so much time and energy to give to other things that are here today and gone tomorrow. My friends, we haven't seen the glory. That's the trouble with us. Listen again to the author of the epistle to the Hebrews putting it. He's talking about this same blessed person who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person is referring to what Christ is to God and upholding all things by the word of his power. That's Jesus of Nazareth. He is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. And he's been in this world as a man. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed when this way is prepared, says the prophet. When this incarnation takes place, when this deity and humanity become one, when the valleys are raised and the mountains are brought low, then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. He'll stand before men. That's what he means. And all this has happened literally in this world. Very well then, I say, as we look at him, what do we see? Well, he tells us himself in his great high priestly prayer. He turns to his father and he says, Father, I have glorified thy name. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. How did he glorify his father? I say literally I could keep you for hours. I'm only going to give you headings. He glorified and manifested the glory of his father in his power. Look at his miracles. Who is this person who can fall asleep in the stern of a boat and yet when the disciples are frantic and panic-stricken can get up and can say to the wind, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and can stop the raging of the waves and there was a great calm. Who is he? What's he doing? He's manifesting the glory of God. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. 
Look at him walking into the house of Jairus. And they all laughed him to scorn, knowing that the child was dead. And he just takes the hand of the little girl and says, Talitha, kumi. And she opened her eyes and sat up. Look at him entering a little place called Nain one afternoon. And coming to meet him is a procession. And immediately behind the coffin and the beer is a poor widow woman who's following to his burial her only son, her only child. And he stopped the procession. And he raised up the young men and gave him back to his mother. What is this? It's a manifestation of the glory of God. The power of the maker and the creator and the sustainer of all that is. He's manifesting it. And likewise with all his miracles at the grave of Lazarus, the same thing. Oh yes, he manifested the power of God and likewise the holiness of God. There was no sin in him. The devil attacked him in single combat and brought out all his reserves. He silenced him with a word. He just quoted scripture. He repulsed him. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, and Satan had to go. The holiness of God is another aspect of the manifestation of the glory of God. And then look at his love and his compassion. You would like to know what God is like? Well, look at him. Always had time for a case of need and of suffering. One day he and his disciples were hurrying along to go into the temple. He saw a blind men. He had to stop and deal with him. Another day a poor woman came and worried him and the disciples were annoyed with her and tried to keep her out. He had time for her. He's then going through Jericho and the poor blind man comes and says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. They tried to silence him and keep him back. He stopped. He stood still, and he dealt with him. The women brought the little children for him to put his hands upon them and bless them, and the disciples rebuked them. He nevertheless put his hands upon them and he blessed them. What's he doing in all this? He's revealing God. God is like that. He who hath seen me hath seen the Father, the concern, the care, the love about sinful, bruised, broken, miserable, wretched humanity. But I mustn't hold you, let me come to the final and the greatest thing of all. The glory of God, I say, is revealed in the very sending of the Son. The glory of God is revealed in the person of the Son. But the supreme manifestation of the glory of God is in the salvation that the Son has brought and especially in the way in which it has been done. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It was in his life, in his teaching, in his power, in his everything. But oh, above everywhere else. In his death upon the cross. And that is why Isaac Watts could sing when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. The Prince of Glory. How do you see the glory there in the cross? Well, let me show you very hurriedly. There we see supremely the wisdom of God. You see, the glory of God consists in all the attributes of God. It is what God is in his essential being. That is the glory of God shining forth. And there I say in the cross, you see the wisdom of God. For, my friends, the problem of men and the problem of sin in men is a mighty and a terrible problem. It's a problem which has baffled the whole of mankind from the very beginning. The history of every, cell, of, of every civilization is nothing in a sense but the history of men's attempt and endeavor to deal with the problem of sin. 
What is civilization? Well, it's men's attempt to find happiness, to produce peace and concord, to make life livable, to make life happy and harmonious. That's the great attempt always of civilization. It's been the quest of all philosophers. It's the quest of all the statesmen and the politicians. Mankind, in thinking, is trying to work out a way of life that is bearable. But it's never solved it. And it is failing as drastically and as tragically tonight as it has ever done in its long history throughout the centuries. It requires wisdom to solve the problem. In Christ, you see the wisdom of God solving it. That's why Paul says that we preach Christ Jesus, Christ crucified, to the, Greeks a stumble, to, the, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but unto us which are saved. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God, if I may speak with reverence, applying his mind to the problem of sin in fallen men. And what a perfect way it is. You see what he did? The problem was this. How can men be forgiven by a holy God? What can happen to fallen nature? How can men be given a new nature? He needs it. Nothing else will suffice him. Can the leopard change his spots or the Ethiopian his skin? Can a man by seeking find out God? Can a man pull himself up out of moral gutters? He can't. That's the problem. What can be done about it? Here's the wisdom of God coming in. God said, I will send down mine own son, my only son. And he came down. And he took unto him human nature. Human nature has been linked on to the divine and the eternal. In him you have perfect God, perfect men. He's taken unto himself human nature. And thereby he is able to redeem and to lift up mankind. That is, you see, the wisdom of God. It became him, says the author of the epistle to the Hebrews in the second chapter, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. I like that phrase, it became God. He means this, isn't it like God to do it like that? How perfect it is! Whoever would have thought of such a thing, that God should, as it were, become men, that the word should be made flesh and dwell among us. But that's how it's happened. That is the wisdom of God. And it's a facet of the glory of God. And then think of the manifestation of the power of God in all this. How he defeated the devil. Yes, how he defeated death. How he defeated the grave. He's defeated everybody and everything. Every enemy of men has been routed. Everything that holds men down and enslaves him. Christ has built for them all. And thereby the glory of God has been revealed in all its absolute power. But have you ever thought of the glory of God revealed in Christ in the way of salvation in this sense? Has there ever been such a manifestation of the holiness and the righteousness and the justice of God as you see there? Why has the Son of God come to us? Why should he be born as a babe? Why should he work as a carpenter? Why should he sweat drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane? Why should men spit in his face? Why should they thrust a crown of thorns upon his brow? Why should they abuse him and jeer at him and mock him? Why is he going through all this? There's only one answer. The justice and the holiness and the righteousness of God are such that nothing else could satisfy them. Sin had to be dealt with. And as I look at the cross, the first thing I see is this unutterable holiness and righteousness and justice of the God who has said that sin must be punished. That sin is so terrible it must be blotted out. It's the righteousness and the holiness and the justice of God that demands that death upon the cross. And that is a part of the glory of God. His ineffable holiness, his unspotted and his unchangeable righteousness. 
God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He's the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's no suspicion and can be in God of any compromise with sin and evil. He's of such a pure countenance that he cannot even look upon it. And all that glory of God demanded that sin must be dealt with in a just and a righteous manner. And it happened on the cross. Sin was there punished in the person of the only begotten Son. But, of course, at the same time, it is the most glorious manifestation of the love of God that can ever be known. Nothing I say with reverence can ever give anyone a greater conception of the love of God than the cross of Calvary. Because, you see, it means this, that God has so loved us rebels, miserable, wretched pygmies that we are, who have pitted ourselves against God in all his glory because of our unutterable ignorance. That glorious God has so loved me that he sent his son to suffer all that, that I might be forgiven, that he might reconcile me unto himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. It's the measure of his love to me. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's what it means, that God spared him nothing of the suffering and the shame. It was all essential. And God meted out the punishment of my sins upon him that I might be forgiven. All for us. It isn't surprising, therefore, is it, that a man once wrote a hymn like this, and we're going to sing it in a moment. Great God of wonders, all thy ways are matchless, godlike, matchless, and divine, all of them. Nature and creation, history, the ordering of events, all thy ways are godlike, matchless, and divine. But the fair glories of thy grace, more godlike and unrivaled shine. Who is a pardoning God like thee? And who has grace so rich and free my dear friend, have you seen that? The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, said Isaiah, 800 years before it happened. He saw it coming. The vision was given him. But you and I don't look forward to this. We look back to it. It has happened. It's taken place. The glory of the Lord has been revealed. Did you know that? Had you seen that? Were you aware of that? Did you know that all that, that, that God has done all this for you? Were you aware of this manifestation of the glory of God in his righteousness and holiness and love and every other aspect? Have you seen it? All flesh shall see it. Have you seen it? Do you already know this and realize it? Have you seen this glory of God in its many facets shining in upon you in Christ and in his great salvation? Oh, I'm carrying with the question and keeping you for this reason. There is a day coming when every eye shall see him. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, all together if you like. My friends, a day is coming when every eye shall see him, this person in whom the effulgence of God's glory is concentrated to perfection. 
That is the message of this book which we call the Bible. That every man and woman that has ever been born at any time in any place anywhere will have to see him. And you see what determines what you will feel at that moment is what you know about this glory now. If you've seen the glory of God in salvation in Christ, that's a day to be looked forward to. That's a day to be longed for. That's a day that means the end of sin and and shame and suffering, the end of all agony. It means seeing him and being made like him and enjoying enjoying eternity with him. But according to the same scriptures, if we haven't seen that glory while yet in this world, when we see him then, every eye shall see him, yea, and they that pierced him. And they shall cry unto the rocks and to the mountains, Fall upon us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. My dear friend, I'm not here to frighten you, but I'm just here to say this. The glory of the Lord has been revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ in all its perfection, in the way I've been describing to you. And it's for you. It isn't a theoretical matter. It's a personal message which says this, that the only way in which you can be forgiven is to believe and know that Christ, the Son of God, came into the world to bear your sins and to die for you, and that you renounce sin and give yourself to him, and he will give you life anew and make you a child of God. You either see that the glory of God and God's way of salvation is in him and rely upon that at all, or, or, or nothing else, or else I say, you remain where and as you are, And of course there's no need to argue about this. The appearing of Christ will be the condemnation of all unbelievers in and of itself. It must be. When God has done this, I say again, God can't do more. God has sent forth his own son. He sent him even to the death of the cross. There is nothing left that even God can do about your salvation. He's done everything. He's done the last thing. And not to believe and accept this and to give yourself to this Christ and submit yourself ultimately and utterly to him is, I say, to bring judgment upon yourself. The glory of the Lord has been revealed. It's to be seen in the face of Jesus Christ. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to reveal the light of the knowledge of what? Of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See it. Begin to glory in it. And be eternally saved by it. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.